When you think about scene processing, I want you to think about scene processing and the various people who will be involved in that scene processing as working in a conga line. You guys know what a conga line is, right? You guys been to a wedding before? Conga line is that dance where one person leads the whole group and then everybody else kind of goes through like in a, in a chain. You guys know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. It's follow the leader, exactly right. Who is the leader, the person who enters the scene first? The photographer. You kind of have co-leaders. You have the photographer right there with the detective. Because what happens is they can then move into the scene. Keep in mind, before they actually move into the scene, they're going to photograph the exterior of the scene. So think about a house, for example. Before we actually move into the house, we're actually going to completely photo document the outside of the house first. So once we've done that, we can then move into the house, and typically we're going to photo document the area right there at the entryway. Right? So we'll photograph that, and then once we're done photographing that, we can move into the house to the next room, and then we can photograph the next room. Once I've photographed the room, others can come in behind me now and do their job. Maybe they're processing for fingerprints, maybe they're collecting the evidence. They're not going to do that, though, until I've done my job first. So on this slide, you can see the title of the slide says, Photograph First. Please write this in your notes. Highlight it, underline it. It's probably the most important thing I'll say all night. Always photograph first. That's the number one rule of crime scene processing. There's a slide that says this that's going to pop up a little bit later on, but I want to make sure I emphasize it now. The number one rule of crime scene processing, and by the way, if you don't think this is going to show up as a test question, you're nuts. The number one rule of crime scene processing is always photograph first. Always photograph first. I cannot say it enough times. Always photograph first. It used to drive me nuts uh, when I used to watch CSI when it first came on the air 14, 15 years ago. Because when I watched the program, crime scene investigators would enter the crime scene, they would find something on the ground. Maybe they enter our crime scene, they see the gun on the ground, and they're like, oh, there's a gun. And they reach down and they pick it up. Holy crap, we don't ever do that. <laughs> there are a whole lot of things we have to do first before we will ever touch that firearm. We're going to start by taking photographs of it. We're also going to make measurements indicating its location. We're going to create sketches. We're going to start keeping notes. We always take pictures first because we need to record the crime scene in as close to its original condition as we can. We always want to record the crime scene in its original condition, its unaltered condition. Which means we don't start throwing fingerprint powders on walls trying to find prints until we first photograph those walls. Always photograph first. That is why the crime scene processor who is going to be taking the photographs is the first person in the crime scene. You with me so far? Like I said, all the other personnel, all the other officers, other detectives, everybody else has to wait for what you do. What if we have a dead body? Maybe it stinks. Maybe it's, it's a, a body that's been there for a week and it's decomping and it just reeks. Does that mean everybody else has to stop what they're doing because we got to get that body out of here ASAP? No. We process our way to the body. The big and important detail to remember, we always work from outside in. And so if that body is way on the interior of the home, we may not get to it for a while. You have to smell it the whole time. hundred percent. Yep. So for example, here in Maricopa, we have the office of the medical examiner. And what will happen is if there is a homicide, the police will contact the office of the medical examiner and say, we have a suspected death. One of the first things that that the medical examiner's office will do is they'll ask a question. Okay, when do you want us there? Really what they're wanting to know is, okay, how long is it going to take you until you're done processing so we can come in and get the body? Because if they show up early, do we stop what we're doing? Does Phoenix PD stop what they're doing because the medical examiner is there and wants to collect the body? No, now it just means that the person from the ME's office has to wait. So they would rather kind of coordinate, they'll go to another scene we come back to that. Because if they're there early, they just have to wait. So do they wait to, to declare them like the coroner? They have to wait until you guys are done before they... Well, there's a decent chance that EMTs have already been there and, and, and determined the person was indeed dead. So 
So oh. how do they get in if it's, how do they get in if it's Well, we let EMTs in. So we restrict personnel entering the scene with the exception of emergency medical personnel. We have to let them in. All right. So far, so good. All right, now. It's okay if you need to to let someone from the Emmy's office in just to quickly verify death, if that's indeed the case. But we're not going to let them remove the body. We're not going to let them roll that body over, uh, anything like that, until we've fully documented the scene. All right? They're not going to want to do that either. They don't want to remove the body until we're done. All right, now, because the photographer is the first person that has to complete their job before everybody else can do theirs, Everybody else has to wait for you. You better be ready to get your job done. And you better be efficient at it. How's it going to go over? So let me give you a scenario. I work for DPS. So the crime scenes that we typically responded to at DPS, again, part of DPS is how we patrol. So the Arizona Department of Public Safety Crime Lab, we provided forensic science support for all agencies. But in particular, we provided a lot of support for the highway patrol. So if there's a massive accident that's happened on the freeway, and we would, pro we would provide the forensic science support, the photography, for example. So let's say we've had a massive accident on the I-10 here in Phoenix. And that accident involves several cars that have rolled over. And we have shut down the freeway. So I-10 is shut down running through the middle of Phoenix. That's a big deal. I-10 is the major corridor heading east-west, right? You think they want to keep that closed down very long? Yeah. No. All right, so let's say you're the crime scene investigator and you roll up on scene. You've got to take the photos, because we can't remove the bodies, we can't remove the cars, until we've photographed everything. So now you're the photographer, you've rolled up on scene, you take your equipment out of your bag, and you realize, oh, you know what, guys, I forgot my flash. Can everyone just chill out while I go back to the crime lab and get it? Is that going to go over real well? No. No. So when you roll up on scene, you better freaking make sure you're prepared by making sure you have all of your equipment and making sure it's actually working properly. So a very likely test question on the final exam, by the way, is name at least 10 things that you would need to bring with you to make sure you're fully prepared to photo document that crime scene. And when I say 10 things, remember, you're a crime scene investigator. So there's other stuff you're going to bring too, things like fingerprint powders and stuff like that. I'm talking about if you're going to be the photographer, name 10 photo things you need to bring with you. Let's see if we come up with a list. We should be able to. Shout some out for me. Camera. Camera, thank you. That's first and foremost, right? Lenses. All right, camera. Let's talk about camera first. First of all, am I going to bring a camera? No. no. I'm going to bring at least two. Or more. Four more, exactly right. Primarily, the, the camera I'm, I'm going to use the most, of course, is my DSLR. But remember, when we talked about photographing footwear tire tracks last week, I said you should take photos using what? Film, so you should have a film camera with you too. Or at a minimum, at least another DSLR as a backup in case your camera stops working. So cameras, plural. Now if you have cameras, Joanna mentioned lenses. For sure, at least your standard lens, but you may also want to have telephoto long lenses or wide angle short lenses too or at least a zoom lens that you can adjust. That's a great uh, suggestion. Chris mentioned a tripod. For photographing footwear and tire tracks, we know we need a tripod. What else do we need to bring with us? Batteries. Flash. Batteries. Batteries for my camera and batteries for the flash. A flashlight. Thank you very much. So I have some of these things up here, right? So you guys mentioned we need to bring a camera. Scales. All right, good. I need a, I need a scale. I need a flashlight. Color card, I forgot to grab it. Yes, that should be on the desk up here. You guys mentioned batteries. So I got batteries for my flash, batteries for my camera. You guys mentioned the flash, right? If I'm using my flash, some of the times I want to move the flash off camera, so what else do I need? I need my SIG cord, right? I'm going to want some sort of evidence markers to put down in the crime scene. So evidence markers. What else? Think about the things we've used this semester. Anything else we've used? Sorry, the photographer um, carries the evidence markers? Yep, all that stuff will be in their kits. Anything else? I'll tell you one. Yes? Yeah, memory cards, plural, thank you. Yes, and films if you're using film. Does 
the camera doesn't do me any good if I have no recording medium to record my image, or any memory medium to record my image. And cards plural, or at least the computer, so that if I fill up my card, I can transfer my photos from the card to the computer so that I can reuse the card. Remember, at a crime scene, we're going to take photos using as highest resolution as we can. So we're going to usually photograph in RAW, which means if our card is maybe 4 gigabytes, we can actually fill that up during one crime scene. All right? Another thing, I'm only 5'7". Guess what another thing I'm going to need in my, in my kids? A, a stool or a ladder. A ladder for sure, exactly right. Even you tall people, there are times you'll need one too. All right. yeah. And I'll, expl I'll explain, <laughs> later, later time I'll explain a situation where you would. All right? That's a pretty good list. I think we got, there's one other one for sure, which actually should have been the first thing you put on your list. Nobody mentioned it. You're on that track. PPEs. Okay. Oh, PPEs. Okay. What does PPE stand for? Personal Protective Equipment. Personal Protective Equipment. Right. So I, I brought in some examples here uh, with me. I'm going to show you guys. I can demonstrate the right way to put pants. All right. Personal protective equipment, right? At a minimum, the absolute bare minimum, what would you wear into a crime scene? Gloves, right? At a bare minimum, you're going to be wearing gloves. Keep in mind, uh, when you walk into a crime scene, uh, you might have to turn a light switch on, for example. And uh, you don't want to be exposing yourself to bloodborne pathogens. Um, so you want to be wearing gloves for sure, right? That's correct. Or living your own prints. We're protecting the crime scene from ourselves as well. So gloves for sure. Is this this is the minimum? What what else would I recommend you put on? Yeah. So uh, I would I would recommend, and this this is for multiple reasons. I would recommend at least you have a surgical mask of some sort, right? I can put the surgical mask on. There's a couple reasons. One, the areas that we're most worried about bloodborne pathogens getting into our body are the areas uh, which, are, which are covered in what we call mucous membranes. So those are things like in our mouth, in our throat, in our nose, our eyes. If we wear a surgical mask over our nose and mouth, we're not going to inadvertently breathe in um, a bloodborne pathogen. Now you're like, why don't you breathe in blood? Okay, well, let's imagine we had a blood stain on the wall, right? So over here we have a blood stain on the wall. One of the ways, if it's a dry stain, there's a couple ways to collect it. If it's wet, we just take a cotton swab and rub it against it. If it's a dry stain, I can take a cotton swab, moisten it with a couple drops of water, and rub it against the stain and collect it that way. Or I can take a scalpel, and I can scrape a little bit of the stain off into an envelope, fold it up. I'll get to your question in just a second, Chris. Now, let's say I'm scraping away some of this dried stain and, I don't know, a gust of wind blows it up in my face. If I inadvertently <gasps> suck in, now I've just sucked in that dried blood, which if it has hepatitis in it, for example, I now just contracted hepatitis. But if I was wearing a surgical mask, it protects my nose and mouth from that. But remember, where else do we have uh, mucous membranes? Our eyes. So we want to make sure we're wearing glasses or goggles of some sort. Um, booties over your feet, right? So you put booties over your shoes when you're walking around. By the way, I've been to some pretty disgusting crime scenes before. Uh, and then also, in some scenes, you're just going to want to suit up, right? <laughs> so we have these suits. We call them bunny suits because they're white like bunny rabbits, right? They're typically made. A company called Tyvek makes them. So I sometimes just care called Tyvek suits. They're waterproof. So you put these on uh, over top of your clothing. Uh, put gloves on, booties on, have, has a hood you can put over the top. Uh, you do this to protect yourself, again, because you don't want to contract any bloodborne pathogens. You might be in a scene where it, it could be wall-to-wall -wall blood. Let me give you an example of a crime scene that we had to process. It was a car from Tolleson. It was uh, two rival gangs. The one gang had kidnapped uh, four members of this other rival gang, stripped them naked, put them inside of an SUV like, a, like, a, like an Escalade, and then sliced their throats. And then they bled out on the inside of this uh, SUV. They, so the, you can imagine, the inside of this SUV is just covered in blood. So let's say it's your job to climb into that SUV and collect evidence. Are you going to go in wearing just gloves? No. 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 You're going to be covered, to, you know, uh, uh, top to bottom. Uh, now, the good thing about these Tyvek suits is that you have a, a hood, 
But you guys notice, I'm so used to, I always wear a baseball cap, especially at crime scenes, because remember, crime scenes are three-dimensional. The blood's not just on the ground and on the wall, it's also on the ceilings, and nothing's grosser than walking around in a crime scene having something drip down on top of your head. Right, so have it. We can something on top of your head. Well, one second. I had Chris had a question first. Oh, um, Chris, what's your question? With the dried blood um, on walls or uh -huh. um, a cloth, what is it like brown? Okay, so if, it's, dark if, brown. if the blood if the blood is brown or if the stain is brown, yeah. Keep in mind, as blood ages, it does turn brown. So actually, blood that's really old will start to look a little like chocolate syrup. Um, so we're still going to collect it. it. What it may mean is it may mean that that stain just been there a real long time. Okay. But we're still going to collect it. Joanne, you had a question? I was going to say, if you're seen and not going to totally suit out, do they, or do you carry like a surgical cap that you can put on? I just wear a cap. But we have caps that we can put on. Would you too. cover your beard? Uh, in that situation, if I need to, I, I usually just put a surgical mask on if I'm worried about contaminating the scene. It just depends on what I'm doing and what I might be exposed to. Because remember, again, we're protecting the scene from us, right. but we're also protecting us from the scene. No, if I'm worried about me contaminating the scene, because keep in mind, if you're gonna collect something that has DNA on it, by the way, you should not be talking when you're collecting it. So if, if this blood stain, for example, that I was talking about here, I should not be chit-chatting with the person over here as I'm collecting it. Because you know when you, when you, when you talk, sometimes you have a tendency to have a little spit come out? Well, guess what? If I spit all over this, I just contaminate it with my own DNA. So if I'm collecting something that has DNA, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a, a surgical mask on, because that way I, I'm protecting myself from the blood stain, but I'm also protecting the blood stain from me. So do you, as a photographer, you wear all of this? It depends on the scene. For example, right, so, so you see these guys, when they go into the scene, Sometimes, you're not just going to be wearing a surgical mask, you can enter a scene wearing full self-contained breathing apparatus. Right, so you might have a respirator with its own oxygen supply. Some crime scenes, if, if there is a case, an overdose case, and we think the person overdosed on fentanyl, I'm not entering that scene unless I'm completely covered. Because you can overdose like that if you're exposed to some, some forms of opiates. Or what we used to have a problem with, when we used to have to get suited up like we see here in these pictures where we're meth, meth labs. Right. You guys have all seen uh, Breaking Bad, right? Yeah. Remember the very first episode of Breaking Bad where they, they kill the one gangbanger by exposing him to uh, phosphorus? Guess what? There's a lot of chemicals that are used in the manufacture of methamphetamine that you don't want to be breathing in. And so if we know that someone's been making methamphetamine in their home, we're going to probably suit up like this before we actually enter the scene. And to answer your question, Dale, if I'm the photographer, remember, I'm one of the first ones in the scene. And so I want to be making sure I'm, I'm suited up. I'm, I'm completely covered. All right, so PPEs. We know what they are. We know we need to make sure we have them with us. 